All right. Hey, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. All right. Very good. Hey, welcome, everybody. Welcome to True North um, and uh, a good-sized crowd tonight. For those that are joining us uh, online, uh, live, thanks to our tech team for making that happen, and we want to welcome you all to True North as well. We know we have a lot of folks that are at home that are either under the weather or uh, not able to make it tonight or in quarantine or you have to work or something else. We're glad you're tuning in online. Send us a text and let us know that you're watching. And then guys, during our four minute party, after we honor our special guest, you guys can go to this camera right up here and give a shout out to anybody who may be uh, watching. To our guest, we will welcome you all in just a minute, but it's a big night here, is that right? Yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a great night. Um... All right, very good. We got it? Are you turned on? Maybe it's not turned on. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. If you have a cell phone, could you silence that so that it's not going to be a distraction? Oh, I don't think mine was silenced. There we go. That could have been a problem. All right, we'll turn that off so that we can uh, keep going. Hey, we want to roll right in tonight because our special guests are here, and we want to give them a chance to make, <clears throat> make a graceful exit at the appropriate time. But we're really, really, really glad to have everybody here in, in the room tonight, a, a great crowd. Um, and so we want to, we'll, we'll meet them all in, in, in a minute individually. But guys, MBYG, guys and girls and adults, would you please join us in just welcoming all of our area principals who've joined us tonight here at True North. For once, for once, we got to call you into our office, and it feels really sweet, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Who was your principal? Like, yeah, you probably had several principals, but who, who was your <clears throat> most memorable principal? Uh, Mr. Otot. He's Mr. My, Mr. Otot. Yeah, he's my elementary school principal. Okay, you said that name really quickly, like you, made, you knew him well. I knew him pretty well. Uh, I got to go to his office on many occasions in elementary school, and then he and uh, his son, my, me and his son played together. That's not good grammar, but... <laughs> At this point, I'm he flustered. He was your English teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was my principal. Uh, the, his son and I played together uh, on our varsity baseball team. So I got to know him pretty well through that. And um, he ended up being the superintendent. Yeah, yeah. So you never had to, like, go visit him. Uh, is there a story when you had to go visit him that you can tell us that, that is not going to make somebody go, oh, that sounds fun, I'll try that? We probably uh, should have rehearsed this little speech first. But there are several people that just set up in their seats like, oh, <laughs> let's get, a, yeah, get an idea. I don't, I don't think I did anything wildly outlandish in elementary school. I think I... I might have started a food fight. Who knows? I mean, I don't remember. Um, it, who's to say? No, no witnesses were there. Um, in, in high school, it would have been different. But I actually tried to get a hold of my high school principal, Doug oh, Green. Wow. Um, I was a student body president at, our, at my high school my senior year, and I, and I tried. I did something that I thought would be harmless and fun, but um, whew, he called me to his office over the intercom. Oh, wow. uh, I, um, there was a school, we were playing McMinn County in, in, in school. Oh, big rivalry. In basketball. And McMinn County had a very dark gym. Their gymnasium was very dark. Like the lights were very, very poor. Okay. And nobody liked playing there. And so uh, I just suggested, since it's a district tournament game, that we should all take flashlights to the game with us oh. and, and turn them on, you know, during the game. Um, I didn't clear that idea uh, and announced it during my announcements because I made the announcements every day. And... And he, he called me from sixth period uh, AP English to come down to his office. And he said, that was not a good idea. And we went to the microphone and we got on there and, and I apologized and said, let's, let's not You had that. to apologize to the whole school? Yeah, over the, over the intercom. Yeah, it Man. was a very, very humbling moment. There's some principals back there going, hmm, okay, I'll write that down. That's good. Um, but we all make mistakes. But we're really glad that you all are here. Uh, and we missed, we, we missed you last year. And we know that your work last year, if there was any year to pray for you all, it would have been last year. Absolutely. Um, but we are so glad to have you here. And in just a moment, we'll get a chance to meet everybody. Um, it's my daughter's birthday. Da Daisy oh, wow. Montgomery is uh, wow, 20, 22. She's 22. So I went to her ring camera today and sang the whole NBYG birthday song. Oh, I thought you were about to say and, no, 22 was, by Taylor recorded. Swift. Yeah, they get that a notification. Been, Somebody's on your front porch and they look <clears> at it. And then... Um, Anyway, that was my, my greeting. What, what, was, what was she said? I, mean, I thought you were about to say you sang the song 22 by Taylor Swift. And well, that I really been, missed the chance, didn't I? Well, you still have, no, what, a couple no, hours? I, I'm not going to go and do that. Uh, that no, would be I a recording not. I'd like to see. 
Yeah, I don't even know that I know the words to that song, thankfully. Oh, Google. Okay, yeah, but uh, maybe I'll just go lip sync it. Anyway, <laughs> all right, if you, uh, no birthdays? Well, then we get to move on. Uh, that's really great. We want to say a word about our girls' night out that is coming up on Saturday, September the 18th from 6 to 10. Where's that going to take place? Here in the filling station. Here? Here in, in the filling room? station, right, right here. You all are going to be uh, watching the, uh, the Princess Diaries together, playing some awesome games, eating some pizza. It's going to be $3 a person. Ladies, how much is it going to be? $3. All right, what day is it going to be? Yeah, I, I should have said what date or what day yeah. of the week, but y'all got it. Y'all covered it. Saturday, September the 18th from 6 to 10 p.m. in this room. You'll get more information in the top 10, which will be coming out Thursday or Friday. Be looking for that uh, coming up. It's going to be a lot of fun, especially uh, those of you that had fun at the girls' retreat. Invite those that did not go on the girls' retreat to come and, uh, and hang out and get to know one another. That, that's going to be uh, a lot of fun. Okay, uh, real quick, we're going to look at our pictures of the week. Our pictures of the week, they don't exactly have a principal theme, but kind of. You'll see that at the end. So you, um, fall break, you're going on a trip, right? Yes. Where are you going? Can you tell us? Well, I'll say it, but apparently everybody else is going there also. We're going to Universal. Okay. So you'll be at Universal. Oh, really? and uh, oh, October wow. 2nd through the 6th, probably. It's like everybody else. We'll be all riding the Hulk. Cooper You'll be got a- really excited about it. He was like, oh, it's, gonna ex- it's going to be exciting. The Velocicoaster? Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. Cannot wait. Um, Cooper, you were just a, you need to be on a Disney Channel show. You, yeah, you're like the best <laughs> friend of somebody on a Disney Channel show. Like Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Like you're, you Maybe would like, be like the best friend of one of the kids on that show. All right. Am I wrong? No. I, I mean that as a I mean, compliment. Like, I mean like probably like. I mean that as a compliment. Like Diary 2010s. Of a Wimpy kid not, not Disney Channel now, but like 2010s Disney Channel. I mean, you're not like the Kimmy Gibbler best friend. You're like, the, you're like the, I don't know. I, I don't know. You're like, um. Who is the best friend? Uh, Paul, uh, Paul from the Wonder Years. Anyway. Who's the be- right. best friend of Corey? Here from, are the pictures uh, of the week. 12? Here they are. I'm the, I started wow, I this. dated I'm myself. I, I started. Okay. Uh, I want to share with you some, um, some Disney oh. park secrets. How many of you really, really consider yourself Disney aficionados? Raise your hand. How many of you are wondering what the word aficionado means? All right. Oh, let's, we can enjoy the music together. You've been to Disney? No. Yeah. A long time ago. Well, I went when I was 19, but it was for, okay. it was for New Year's, so I didn't really see it. So some of you in the room will actually know some of these secrets. For example, most of us know about the forced perspective at Disney. These are not secrets. That, that, these are not really secrets anymore. Forced perspective, basically, you know, they make things look taller than they are. By the way, they make them smaller as they go up. And so the buildings on Main Street are, are shaped differently so that when you walk in, it looks like it's uh, farther down the road. When you're leaving, it looks like you're closer to the exit because wow. of forced perspective. And they feel like, oh, I don't have a long way to walk, like I can get out of here. But when you walk in, you're like, oh, wow, look at this. And the, the castle's not really that, you know, ginormously tall, but it looks like that. That's a secret most people know. Some of you know the secret that Walt Disney wanted to make sure that no land was visible from any other land. So this is actually all of Disney World. But if you go into just the Magic Kingdom, no land is easily visible from any other land because he wanted to keep the world separated, which is why they have the underground passages because one day Walt saw a cowboy walking through Tomorrowland, you know, leaving work and that thought, no, that can't happen. Like we can't mess with people's world. So other secrets that you might not know is that there is something unique about Liberty Square. Does anybody know something unique about Liberty Square? Which is uh, one of my favorite places to be, by the way. But now that, I'm, now that I'm older, it might not be one of my favorite places to be. That's a hint. <laughs> There's no restrooms in Liberty Square because the Imagineers oh. wanted it to be true to the period of time. So there are no restrooms in Liberty Square. You have to go through the the tunnel to get to Fantasyland to go to the, to the bathroom because uh, in this time period there were no public restrooms. So the, anyway, that's a secret most people don't know. So just Had keep no that clue. in mind next time you go there. Also, I just learned this this week. Every American flag in Disney either has a star missing or a stripe missing um, to make them non-official flags so they don't have to abide by the official flag rules of lowering flags at half-mast and, and, and all the government orders about flags. They don't have to follow those 
because they're not real flags. What a loophole. They refer to them as uh, banners. So there you go. Uh, another Disney secret. They, they take the horses down Main Street, and they have a very special coating on the horseshoes to make them clop even louder so that it, you, know, you hear it, and it's like, oh, I love that sound. Uh, that's one secret. Maybe some of you know. Uh, somebody knows what this is. Who knows what this is? Somebody knows. What, what is that? Yes, right. It is a smellitizer. Do you know what a smellitizer is? No. <laughs> uh, they're these. They hide them underneath like the, the candy store or the bakery, and they pump out scents, not pennies, wow. but smells. I feel like you're taking the magic away from Disney. I know. Keep well, going. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, cotton candy, but I might, this ends with, with a, a, a return of magic. <laughs> okay. Just so you know. Uh, but yes, I'm probably ruining a lot of things. Uh, certain rides have enhanced sound effects. For example, the splash on Splash Mountain, it's, it's, it's not the real sound of the splash. They, they make the sound of the splash. And they also pipe in like cheering and crowd screaming oh, noises so like the ride the, sounds louder and more fun than it really is. Like the Atlanta Falcons did a couple uh, years ago. Yeah, very good. And so, so you have um, uh, the, the, the splash and you hear this large splash. It's not the real splash. Uh, okay, this is the Emporium. It is the coldest room building in all of Disney World. That's a note I'll take advantage of. Yeah. You know why? Because it's cold. And it's hot because in Florida. Because they sell sweatshirts in there. And who's going to buy a sweatshirt when it's 95 oh. degrees outside? And so when they started lowering the temperature of the Emporium, more people bought sweatshirts. I guess they're like, oh, I need a sweatshirt for in here. And they buy it and wear it. And, and they, they walk, walk outside, outside and go, whew, I'll take this off now. I don't know how that works. But somehow it actually Interesting. works. Uh, in Disney... Who, who can fill this one in? Somebody knows this one. This one's pretty well known. Walt Disney watched people walk through the park carrying trash, and he wanted to see how far you would walk with a piece of trash before you threw it to the ground, like looking for a trash can. Oh, wow. And he counted all day as the story is told, and it was 30 steps. You look around 30 steps, one, two, three, four, and 30 steps, then you throw a piece of trash away. Well, um, so Walt Disney said there's going to be a garbage can every 30 steps outside in the Magic Kingdom. And if you go there, you'll see them. They're everywhere. Um, that's another secret most people don't know. They, they make the sidewalks in Disney this red color, which you can't really see in this picture because of the light. But they, they make them this very unique red color because it makes all the other colors pop, right? All the, the greens and all the other colors will pop even bigger because the, um, you can take your glasses and, and verify find this. Yeah, yeah. Find that out when you go next time. Say. So uh, how many of you, uh, this, this will be very difficult maybe for you. You do know this one. Tell us about it. It's the color that makes stuff like, disappear. Yeah, it is the color that makes things disappear. It's called Go Away Green or No See Me Green. And it's a color that's used all throughout Disney World. So whether it's on you know, water pumps or whether it's on the lights that are outside or on some of the speakers that are hidden or the walls when they're doing construction, they paint it this color of green because they say this color pretty much disappears to the human eye. And so you've got like the, uh, the elusive uh, Club 33 or some cast entrances, cast member entrances are colored this color of go away green or no see me green because your eye just goes right over it to the next big color. So Disney has a lot of places they don't want you to focus on, and so they do that. All right, this is the one I want to end with, and this is the one that I think is probably the coolest, and somebody may know this story. Does anybody know where you would find this in the Magic Kingdom? I saw a hand. Do you know? You want to guess? Just guess. You probably can guess. Uh, no, but you're, you're close. You're closer than anybody else, by the way, because nobody else guessed. Um, <laughs> It, she could have said Epcot, and they would have been closer. But uh, it is in a palace. Okay, all right. There is a story behind this particular. It's on a wall in Disney World, and it's on the wall behind this fountain statue of Cinderella. And there's Cinderella, and there's this wall. The cool thing about this that I didn't know, one of my friends who works at Disney told me this some time ago. Um, in, in another context, but he said, hey, here's something that's really cool because he knows that I love this is kind of like that moments. And so he said, if you are an adult and you are staring at this, you know, you see Cinderella, but he said, if oh, you wow. go to it and if you kneel down and, and bow one knee or get down on your knee, or if you are a child and you get it and you look at this statue, that crown wow. that is on that, on that wall fits right on her head. But he said, you have to be either kneeling in front of the statue right. or you have to be a child to get there to see it and he said so it was kind of Walt's way of saying I want kids to be able to see things 
that adults are going to miss because they're too big. Wow. Um, and so when I saw this particular story, I thought, as I'm trying to find pictures of the week that might relate to our guest tonight, this is the first thing that I thought of is that a lot of you that are principals or vice principals, assistant principals, school administrators, whether it's high school, middle school, or we have even some elementary principals here, um, you know what it's like to see the world through the eyes of either a child or even through a, a teenager. Because one of the reasons when people ask me, how, can you, how have you done youth ministry for 25 years? The answer is really simple. Um, the, the biggest reason, there are several reasons, but one of them is that you constantly remind us, remind me, how to see the world differently because you don't all think you figured it out completely just yet. Now, your parents may go, uh, incorrect. <laughs> My child thinks they have. But uh, it's certainly for a child. And to the principals, you all are working with all of this age group in our community that sees things from a perspective that some of us grown-ups can't see. And so we wanted to just remind you of that, to thank you for that, and to call all of us uh, in just a minute when our principals, uh, we dismiss everybody and we enter into our time of teaching and worship. We'll come back to this story because it's pretty important when we go to worship every week that we remember sometimes we have to take a posture that is a little different than the rest of the world or we're going to miss we're going to miss, you know, royalty uh, among us. So there you go. Uh, those are your uh, pictures of the week with a, a short little message. This is kind of like that. And uh, now, now we want to take a moment to welcome uh, some of the heroes in our uh, county, uh, in our area. Uh, there we go. Up in the morning and we have many of our principals that are here. Two years ago, we had 25 principals. We knew that number would be a little less. As a matter of fact, many of your principals emailed to say, Hey, I'm just not able to make it because I'm either teaching a class at my own church or because of the situation at our school, it's probably best that I avoid large crowds. We completely sensitive to that. And to those that are here, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Normally, all of your students will surround you. We're not going to do that, so don't worry about that. In just a moment, we'll call you up. We're going to put you all in the middle of the room and let you space out. And students, we're going to surround, and parents, we're going to surround all of these heroes from our community. And a couple of our students have been asked to lead a prayer for everyone all together. So, um, you know, we are sad that you won't get to be prayed for just by the students at your school. But we want to make sure that we still do this in a way that, that, that is safe and appropriate. So. We're going to call some of you, uh, all of you up here, not necessarily in uh, all from the same school at the same time, but in the order in which you signed up on the sheet. So some of you, there may be some principals that don't have a lot of students here, so we want all of us to greet them. But if they're from your school, then you can certainly, you know, cheer, feel free to cheer a little bit louder. But we want everybody to be greeted. And we're just going to ask you all to come up here in just a moment. We are going to ask that every principal or assistant principal or vice principal is going to select one student from your school to help them in a, in a simple challenge. Don't worry, principals, nothing embarrassing is going to happen. We don't want to get called to your office, but we want to, um, we'll be competing for something in just a minute. But before we do that, let's welcome up here, and you all can just come and take the stage. You can, on the steps or on the floor, you can spread out up here. However you need to do that, we'll call you up one at a time. Students, let's welcome them one at a time. In the order in which they sign up on the sheet, we have uh, from Central Magnet School, John Ash. Dr. Ash. Also from Central, we have uh, Dr. Amy Guthrie. Now, to all the principals beyond that, I don't have formal titles, so I don't want to leave out, uh, I apologize, I don't want to leave out a, a, a doctor, but um, I'll just call up the rest of them as they signed up here. From uh, Christiana, Zane Perry. Come on up, Zane. Also from Christiana, uh, is it Kyle? Kyle Nix? Did I say it right? Kyle Nix, come on up. Also from Christiana, Marcy Turner. From Riverdale High School, Tamara Blair. From Siegel High School, Larry Creasy. From Stewart's Creek Middle, LaToni Murray. From MTCS, Dr. Robert Sane. 
Also from MTCS, Nicole Hurt. And for the first time ever from Watertown High School, uh, Darren Brown. Now, there might have been some uh, middle or high school principals that came in after the fact. Is there anybody else that we have not called yet? Any name that we have not called? And I know at the appropriate time when we all pray, we have some elementary principals here, <clears throat> Dr. Blair. And so you feel free to get in the middle there. We want to pray for, uh, for you, uh, you as well. Okay, so um, I like how we lined up over here and then all the way over there. It's good. All right, so we want to ask you in just a moment to select one student. Now, if you are a student from that school, they may not know that you're here or know exactly who you are, but we only need one student per principal, not per school, but per principal. So if any of the principals are here, I don't know, um, everybody should have somebody here. Do we have a, is there a Riverdale student? Some of our Riverdale students are not here because they play football. Do we have a, okay, all right, very good. We do have a Riverdale student. All right, very good. So uh, principals, would you mind, you're going to come this way, find a student, and then you can spread out on the stage. And we'll give you one of these in just a minute. If you are one of the students from that school, you can volunteer to assist. Or you'll be, you'll be inscripted into service. So find a student. Find a student. All right. I'm going to ask Cedric, would you do a favor? Would you give one of these to every pair? Okay, so you all will hold on to this. One for every pair. Would you pass one out to every pair, please? All right, do, do we have somebody from every, do you have somebody from your school? Well, you, you can come join. You all can be a team together. No, no, come on. Everybody's going to be a part. You all are going to be a part together. You can cooperate. Uh, let's see, does everybody have a, a partner? Do we have anybody from Stewart's Creek? Okay, they're coming up. Okay, we have a Stewart's Creek. What? No, you all can help. You all can both work together. Work together. All right, we got somebody? All right, let's do this. Uh, Blake, we've been excited about this because it's been two years since we have competed. Yeah. For, uh, for one of the grandest prizes in all of Rutherford County. Yeah, only 15 people or so get to compete for it a year. That's right. Now, how many distinguished winners of this prize are on the stage tonight? Who has won this prize once before? Oh. Two of you before. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen. And we, we learned something new. There's never been a, a repeat winner. That's right. Say it again. There's never been a repeat winner of this uh, prestigious We've never had a winner two years in a row. Or, or two years at all. Yeah. So and this well, could be the first We're time. not going to say COVID won. We're just going to. Yeah. Um, no, we're not going to write down COVID's name on, the, on the, uh, the cup. All right. So everybody, would you please welcome and bring to the filling station the esteemed. It looks like an icebox from a hotel, but it's not. It's the principal's cup. It is now making its way into the filling station. Crank it up, Mike. What a moment. Everybody take this in. Let's just listen some more. It's pretty emotional. Yeah, it's been a while. Still got the. This the dust is on the it. principal's cup. If you look on the back of the principal's cup, you will see the winners. It's a little hard to see here, <laughs> uh, but let's see. We have uh, Mr. Barlow won it, and then uh, it looked like Dr. Ash won it, then Dr. Blair, then Mr. Torres, Dr. Sane, Miss Coronado. She brought it back and delivered it to me at Bojangles last night. Uh, the uh, the principal's cup. Prestigious. It was remember? a very prestigious. very prestigious handoff. Yes. It was, People driving by were like, what is happening over there? Um, so here we go. Inside, wait, it gets even better. Inside the principal's cup. Oh. oh. Look at there, everybody. This right here, these right here are the strawberry candies that, will pull that you out have a in your seat. That what? That will pull out a filling. That's right. They, be careful. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have these for Not, a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I came for a couple more weeks. That's right. These uh, are the strawberry candies that were given to us by my elementary principal, Ann Colbreth. I did also try to locate her to let her know that the legacy of these is living on all these years later. Um, and you can pass these out to your students, uh, or, or you can keep them all for yourself. 
We're going to compete for the Principal's Cup. This is how this is going to work. All right, Blake and I are going to walk you through a challenge. You have an arrow. That arrow is either going to go up or down. So everybody point the arrow up, and then everybody point the arrow down. The arrow is going to go up or down. You're allowed one miss on the honor system. So Dr. Sane, if you miss one, you and Matthew have missed one, but then you can keep going. But once you have missed two, you are out. <laughs> Mr. Murray's like, you're out. If you missed two, you're out. He's, uh, uh, is your name on here? Is it? Not yet. Not yet. Not Not yet. yet. All right. Good okay. answer. Good answer. All right. Let's find out who's going to win the Principal's Cup as we play a game called Higher or Lower. Higher or Lower. Stupid human trick. Yeah. It's the stupid human trick. Okay. Now, principals, you can watch the uh, screen back there or you can pay attention back here, but you may be able to see it back there. We're going to give you, uh, here's how the game works. The correct answer is it higher or lower than the number that's given, okay? So if I said I'm 49 years old and you guess, okay, thank you, students. Uh, you say the answer is higher, then you would be correct, all right? These are a little tougher than that. Um, now, you have not seen these questions, have you? I have not. All right, so we'll, let, we'll take turns reading them, and then um, you'll have fun playing along. Does everybody ready? Everybody understand? Now, I understand that some of you have two helpers, and some of you, uh, Christiana's got a whole contingent here. That's okay. Well, it's okay. It's the way we do things around here. But we want to do this before we get to the more serious part of our evening, and then we go. Somebody's going to walk away with this. You just have to promise to bring it back, or you'll be meeting me at Bojangles in the parking lot. <laughs> All right. Blake, take away the very first one. Most spoons balanced on the body. I'm assuming a human body since it's stupid human tricks. So the most spoons balanced on the human body, 120. 120 spoons balanced. Is it more or less? Higher or lower? Get the arrow up. Lock them in. You can't go sideways. Lock the arrow in. And work together, students. Work together. All Higher right. or lower? All right. We got an answer? Three, two, one. Lock it in. Okay. Here we go. You remember, you get one miss. Is it higher or lower than 120? It was 79. If you said lower, if you said lower. Oh, all right, all right. So y'all got it? Oh. That's a lot of spoons. Hey, only one got it right? Oh, Siegel. Okay. All right. So Siegel now has. Wow. A huge a, advantage. Yeah, now, a huge advantage. Everybody else. Unless they miss the next two. Yeah, I, I wonder, do we call an audible and give you two misses? <laughs> I think it was just yeah. a practice round. Oh, they're all say, oh, yeah, that was a practice. Good job, good job, good yeah. save, good save. That was. I'm learning on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the esteemed gentleman from Siegel the, the, the dissents with that uh, vote. All right, we're going to give you two misses starting now. <laughs> all right, here we go. Here we go. The next one. Uh, most live rattlesnakes held in a person's mouth. Emphasis on stupid right here. Yeah. Most live rattlesnakes held in a person's mouth. 14. Is it higher or lower than 14? Higher or lower than 14? All right, lock it in. Lock it in. Three, two, one. And we're locked in. All right, I see both answers. Here we go. The correct answer is it is lower. It is 11. All right, get back in. <laughs> Mr. Creasy wants us to know that he is now two for two. All right. Everybody, if you miss that, Cedric, is it not going well? Now, hey, come on, Dr. Ash, he can be a, our first repeat winner. What would it mean for you to win this a second year in a row, Dr. Ash? It, would, it wouldn't be the second year. Would it be, it more, be in a Would row. it be more or less exciting than doing birthdays no, with so Delaney Sane? it's not in a row. Oh, okay, all right, not close to that. All right, here we go. <laughs> all right. Here's your next question. If you get another miss, you can just step off to the side. Don't go back to your seat. Just step off to the side. Here we are. Go ahead. The longest time of full body contact in snow. Is it higher or lower than 36 minutes and three seconds? Yeah, you just like full body contact. I, I think in you the would snow. have to survive. Yes, Knox. I think you would. Yes, I think that's All part right, of the Lock him in. Lock him in. I don't think it was like 11 snakes in the guy's mouth. He died. Here we go. Snakes. Three, two, one. Log him in. I see a lot of hires. I see wow. one lower. All right. The correct answer is it is higher. Wow. 46 minutes and uh -oh. seven seconds. All right. How many of you have one miss? Who's got a miss? Who is still good? Who's still good? Okay. Here we go. Here's the next one. 
the most toilet seats broken by someone's head in one minute. Oh, man. Is that number higher or lower than 37? By the way, all of these things will get you called to the principal's office. All of these things will make you visit the principal. All right. The most toilet seats broken by someone's head in one minute. Lock them in. Three, two, one. Lock them in. All right. Locked in. Here we go. The answer is it is higher. 46. All right. Okay. Dr. Sane has been eliminated. But MTCS is still Maybe in. Maybe next year. Hold on to it as a MTCS reminder. MTCS is still in the game. There's, hey, Robert, there's still a chance you can go down the hall to Nicole's office and get, get one of the candies. It's still a chance. All right, here we go. Mr. Murray says, not if I can help it. Yeah. Not if I can help it. All right, here we go, guys. Here, here's the next one, Blake. Most rotations done while hanging from a power drill in one minute. 102 rotations. They're hanging from a power drill. I, I would like to see this. Most rotations, higher or lower than 102. Like All right, lock them in, guys. Lock them in. Three, two, one, and we are locked in. Okay, the answer is 148. It's 148. Higher. If you're out, just step off to the side. Oh, wow. Oh, oh. that's a big one. Oh, oh. <laughs> Hey, Har Harper is truly competitive in everything, isn't, isn't she? <laughs> All right, I've never seen somebody more excited about the Principal's Cup. Is it because you like the candies or you just love your mom or both? Oh, okay, good. All right. All she right, didn't here care we go. about the candy at all. Yeah. Here comes the, uh, we're down to, we're down to uh, two principles. Most T-shirts removed while heading a soccer ball. Most T-shirts removed. They had a bunch oh, of shirts on. Okay. They had a bunch shirts of shirts on. on and you're taking one at a time to while head. heading a soccer ball, yeah. pulling shirts off. Is it higher or lower than 33? Lock them in, guys. Three, two, one. Okay. Do both of you have a miss? Do both, you have one miss? You have one miss. That means, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be the, the deciding answer right here. It is now down. <laughs> and we're going to go ahead right now to a four-minute party so uh <laughs> and, yeah, we'll, we'll be back right after this here we go um okay uh, audience what say you higher or lower lower, lower. all right most t-shirts removed who's going home with the principal's cup for 2021 it is lower yeah. oh <laughs> shirts. the principal's cup would you present that to Dr. Guthrie? It's going to there Central go. Magnet School, everyone. All right, stay here. All right. Would you uh, would you hold the cup up there, Dr. Guthrie, and let us get a picture? Can we get a picture there? Hey, uh, who helped you? Okay, get up there. Yeah, you deserve to be in this picture, too. All right, smile big. There we go. One, two, three. Got it. All right, very good. All right, we are going to do this. Principals, could we get all of you to come up on the stage for one quick group picture and then we'll surround you in just a minute here. Can we get all the principals back up onto the stage? You can just get somewhere under the screen. <laughs> All right, squeeze in here. Let's come up here and, all right, very good. Do what? Can we get the stage lights on, Mike? Can we? There we go. All right, here we go. Everyone smile big, smile big. Here we go, one, two, three. Now, Robert, can you show them all how to do the happy face? Yeah, they remember. Some of them are new, though. Here we go. Two hands, smile like this. Here we go. All right, happy face. Here we go. And one, two, three. Got it. All right, very good. All right, now listen very carefully. Students, right now we're going to ask that our principals will come and just space out in the middle of the room. We're going to form a large circle around the entire room, adults and students included, all the way around this way. We have two students. Ian Qualls and Helen Strickland, who have been asked to lead prayers on behalf of all of our, uh, all of our uh, principals. So in just a moment, they will come and do that. Before we ask you, uh, 
principals and vice principals and assistant principals to go to the middle of the room. Uh, just allow us again to say thank you for what you're doing this year, what you did last year. Um, we know that you have a thankless job. You probably received some thanks, but you probably don't. I know you don't receive nearly enough. Um, you're with these students seven, uh, five days a week. Uh, we are with them a couple of days a week, and you see them a lot more than some of us do. And we are thankful that you are in our community. We're thankful that you are devoted to these students. And we know that there have been years and years and years of students that have graduated and gone on to do great things, largely because of the environment that you established in your places of learning, whether it's in middle school or high school or even in some cases elementary school. We are deeply, deeply indebted to you. And it is really a very small token of our appreciation to have an opportunity to, to honor you uh, where we think honor is due. And more specifically, not just to say thank you, but to lift you up. Um, we just, we do believe uh, in the power of prayer and we believe that our schools need to be covered and we want to join a lot of other people in the community uh, in doing that. So thank you for taking time to be with us. We've tried to make sure we could keep everybody uh, safe and we're going to do things a little differently than we've done in the past by just asking you all to get in the middle. We'll all surround you and then tomorrow students at school you can thank your principal for being with us. We will have a four minute party after this to allow them to gracefully leave because we don't expect them to stay all night. You're certainly welcome to stay for the rest of our evening but we know that you have other places to go and be. So let's get our students before we have the principals come down. Would you all stand up and let's just surround the entire room please. Would you just surround the room in one large circle? <laughs> yes. And then all yeah, and all the principals if you can just come stand in the middle of the room. All right. Okay, students. This in itself is a powerful image. It's always cool every year to see pockets of students surrounding their individual principals. Um, but again, I think you can understand why we wanted to do it a little bit differently. We don't want to make anybody feel awkward, but we want to just surround you and know that you're surrounded by this uh, community because we know that times are challenging and they probably are going to get even more challenging in the days to come. And so um, we have asked two students representing two of the many schools that are represented by all of these students here to lead that prayer. Following that prayer, we'll say thank you, everybody, and then we're going to allow our principals an opportunity to, uh, to leave. You can give them a fist bump or an elbow bump on their way out, and then we'll give you about three or four minutes. Mike, that'll be our four-minute party, and then students will come back and get seated, okay? Let's, uh, let's bow together, and uh, Helen's going to start us off with a prayer. All right. Dear God, I come here tonight to thank you for all of these wonderful principles and the blessings that they've poured upon each of our lives, God. Um, I pray that you guide them as they navigate this difficult school year. Um, I pray that you keep them healthy and just keep them safe. Um, please show them your light and your goodness um, in everything that they do. God, I know being a principal during COVID is very difficult, and um, so I pray for peace for each of these principals. Thank you for the way they've led us thus far, for their constant encouragement, and for their constant wisdom, God. Um, you're so amazing. Thank you for your constancy, for the many ways you've revealed yourself, even in the midst of turmoil. Once again, God, I pray that you guide these principals as they learn how to lead through the unknown. Give them courage, comfort, and rest when they need it. God, we love you, and we're endlessly grateful for you. Just thank you so much for all of these people once again. Um, thy will be done. Lord, I pray for this uh, crazy year ahead of us, Lord. Um, I pray that you be, uh, watch over the safety of not only the administrators, staff, and teachers, but the students as well, Lord. Um, I pray that uh, no one gets too overwhelmed with this uh, crazy, unforeseen year ahead of us. Um, but may we still enjoy it and have fun with what we are able to do this year. Um, may we get to make up some of the events that we've missed from the past year, year and a half, Lord. Um, please be with all of us um, at each individual school, Lord. Keep everyone safe. Um, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Guys, join us one more time in saying thank you to all of these heroes in our community. We're going to give you about a four-minute party's worth time to uh, say goodbye to uh, your principals um, and then come back to our seats, and we'll continue on through our evening. Thank you all very much. Have a safe trip home. Hi, my name is Knox. I'm in 11th grade and I go to Central. Yep. I'm also in 11th grade and I go to Central. Back like I am every week. Um, oh. This week we had the principals here, as you can tell. Uh, it was very fun. Yep. But now... Uh, yeah, Skid's going to continue his series, um, 15 is what it's called. And we're going over Luke 15, so... Yep. Be fun. Come back next week. Yes, in person. And before all of our principals leave, uh, Cedri writes a joke every week for us up here on the worship uh, lineup. Cedri writes a joke, and she wrote a really good one this week. They're all, they're all great. Here's a good one. Cedri, hey, here's the joke, everybody. Listen to Cedri's joke. All right, speaking of that mic. What does the MBYG call their favorite faculty members? Say it one more time. We'll read the quote again. Read the, uh, the question again. What does the MBYG call their favorite faculty members? What does the NBYG call their favorite faculty members? I don't know, Cedric. What are they called? Principals. <laughs> Principals. I like wow. it. All right. Very good. I got it. Well, thank wait. you all again for being with us. Cedric, thank you. That was great. I like that one. Thank you. Harper, make sure that your mom takes really good care of the principal's cup. We're really, we're, we're uh, honored that she's going to take that home. Um, do what? Oh, yeah, yeah. Make her go through the halls with it. In the announcements tomorrow. Make sure she shows it in the announcements tomorrow. All right. Hey, thank you all for making that a special night. How many of you did get a chance to greet your principal if they were here in the room? Who did get a chance to talk to your principal? Uh, if you see them tomorrow, would you go and thank them again tomorrow for being there? I know it's an awkward thing to go and talk to your principal, but um, that's really a cool thing that you all did. And it's a really meaningful moment to see all of those servants in the middle of the room. Hopefully next year we can make it a personal, a, a more personal again, but that's a big deal. We're going to spend a little bit of time uh, worshiping, and I want to just remind us back to the picture from the pictures of the week. We take a moment to come and get into a posture where maybe you're not grown-ups yet, but through the rest of the week, you're, you're, you're missing a lot because you're just walking among the crowd. But when you show up here, and you not necessarily kneel, maybe physically, but you just your heart begins to bow, you begin to see that it's not, you know, Cinderella with a crown, but you begin to realize who the, the real royalty and who the real king is. But we miss that. And I'm as guilty as anybody in the room of going throughout my week without taking a viewpoint from someone who is um, honoring royalty. I'm not trying to make light of the creator of the universe by comparing it to a Disney princess or a Disney statue, but the principle of the story, no pun intended, is, uh, is the same, that um, we come here to, to worship together. Some of you are going to help us sing. You guys can come on up and take your place. Everyone else, we'll turn these uh, lights down and we'll uh, sing a few songs together. Um, let's stand as we kind of prepare our hearts to hear some more from Luke 15 tonight. Would you stand up?
mess this one up. Said I was gonna tell me lies, but I.
And the church said? Amen. Uh, really is good to see everybody tonight and to hear you. Um, you certainly sound better than I do, and I appreciate that. Um, if you're tuning in online, we are uh, glad to have you with us. If you've made it this far uh, into our evening, we want to thank our principals again for being with us and thank you for being a part of, of honoring them uh, each and every year. It really, really, really is a big deal. I don't think many of you fully comprehend. Uh, maybe some of you I know that are related to a principal may understand, but uh, how difficult their job has been the last couple of years. And it's really, really challenging. So let's be sure and continue to honor them besides here at True North. We've been locking in for the past couple of weeks on a series that we're calling uh, 15, which comes from Luke 15, which we think is one of the top 52 greatest chapters in all of the Bible. In fact, I've even said that it might even be one of the five most important. If you could only take five chapters to a, a desert island or a communist country or into a village, you know, the, the images that we're watching on television now that most of us, I'm imagining most all of us can't fully comprehend or appreciate what it means to be fleeing a place where you fear for your life. I know a lot of times at my house I'm watching these images and I feel, you know, like I should change the channel when my family or my kids are in the room. And there are times people say, I just can't watch any more of this. And for some reason I feel compelled to watch these images because I, I, I just feel... Not, I mean, not like I owe it to anybody, but I feel like I, I almost owe a debt to just understand what people are going through when they are afraid for their life and afraid for their ability to worship. There are Christians that are still uh, in Afghanistan, Christian American civilians and Christian Afghanis who fear for their life, even, even being a Christian in Afghanistan under normal circumstances was dangerous. I just don't think we really can fully understand what it means to be in a place where being a Christian doesn't just mean that you're going to get laughed at or that you're going to get made fun of or maybe get uninvited to a party or maybe not talked to or sat with, but it means that you're going to be hunted down and targeted and, 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 and possibly killed or horrible things happen to your family. And so Luke 15 is one of those chapters that tells us about the God that we serve. Jesus is the, the storyteller. He's the one that is telling the story. And so last week, we looked at the first of these stories, the story of the lost sheep. Now, we're just going to review a little bit because it's very important to build on these three stories. There's only three stories. The first story is of a lost sheep. All right, I'm going to ask a question. Anybody that wants to can shout out the answer. Normally I like to get a hand raised, but anybody can answer it. How many sheep are there in, the, in this particular story? How many sheep are there? There's a hundred sheep. How many are lost? One. So one percent, right, of this, 90, of this hundred sheep, one is lost, 99 or not. And Jesus asked the people listening to this, he's not quoting a Bible verse. It's very important to understand he's not preaching a sermon. He is at dinner. He's at the dinner table with, with, with um, tax collectors and sinners. And he's being made fun of and they're saying, hey, Jesus, we can't follow you. If you associate with them, we can't be around you. And so they say, why would you associate with people like that? And Jesus apparently either stands up or turns around or goes outside. He understands their muttering. And remember last week he says, hey, 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 hey. Suppose, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. Now, were these shepherds that he was talking to? Largely yes or no? No. They probably, some of them probably owned sheep, but they weren't shepherds in that sense. But everybody in this culture would know what it means to have a, be a shepherd and have a lot of sheep and have one of them wander off. And then what does the person do that loses the sheep, somebody? What do they do? Say it louder. You say find it? Yeah, they, before they found it. That's great. That's the end of the story. Well, it's not really the end. But before they find it, what do they do? So who said it? They look for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was that you? All right, good. Yeah. You're like, is that a wrong answer? Looks, looks for it. You're trying to disguise your voice. So if it was wrong, you'd be like, I don't know who that was. Looks for it. Yeah. Uh, they look for it. They go and they look for it. They actively look for it. And then they find it. They pick it up. They put it on their shoulders and they bring it back. And then what do they do? You know this by now. We've been over this. They threw a party. They celebrate. They call everybody together and they say, hey, this sheep. This sheep that I had, I mean, it's right there on the, uh, in the deal. He goes back and calls all of his friends, and he says, I found my lost sheep. 
And then Jesus says, I tell you, in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner. We use this word, remez. I do want to review this because I had to rush through it really fast last week, and it's, I think it's really important. I know it's very difficult to teach a 7th grade audience through a 12th grade audience and a college audience and adults in the room. It's difficult. So some of the stories are going to connect maybe with some people more than others. And some of the terms are going to maybe go over your head. But I think even the youngest 7th grader can understand this idea of referring or quoting a movie. And everybody knows what you're quoting without you having to say, hey, by the way, y'all, I'm quoting this movie. Everybody does. You do it most every day of your life. All the memes. That's the whole purpose of a meme is to refer to something else. And everybody knows what you're talking about without talking talking about it. And when Jesus asked all these guys, he says, hey, suppose one of you is a shepherd. I changed the words a little bit. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep, but he's implying, suppose one of you is a shepherd. In fact, they are shepherds, not shepherds of sheep, but he's quoting, remember the buckle up passage? And you're like, oh no, here we go again. I'm not going to show the whole thing. I'm not going to show all those words, but I'd be really excited to know if somebody wrote it down last week where it's from and can tell me the passage we're about to look at. It would just be exciting to know that maybe somebody jotted that down somewhere. What, what, what are we going to look at? Say it louder. Yeah, it is, it is Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34. Jesus is very likely referring to this passage that they all would have known. I'm just going to hit the highlights because he says, suppose one of you is a shepherd. They're like, we don't have any sheep. He's like, yeah, 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 but, but you're a shepherd. You mind if I pick on you, Sam? I'm not going to pick on you, but I'm just going to look at you uncomfortably. And you're probably used to you know, me making you feel uncomfortable. Um, he, he goes and he says, hey, you're a shepherd. The Pharisee, I don't have any sheep. And he's quoting this. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Uh-oh, you are a shepherd. You're one of the leaders. And here's what I want you to say to them. This is what the Lord says. Woe to you shepherds who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? So you're outside the house. The tax collectors and sinners are having a party inside the house. Jesus comes out and he says, your sheep are in here. And you're out here. He would go on to, uh, to reference this passage. You've not strengthened the weak or you've not healed the sick. You've not bound up the injured. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and one of them is injured and, and is, is sick or is bound up or caught up in some thorns. I mean, you see how he's re- re- referencing this passage? Y'all follow that? He's clearly diving into this story. He says, you've ruled them harshly and brutally. They were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. Now, again, I realize that some of you are like, this is Ezekiel, this is Old Testament, this is going way over my head. But let's imagine that Jesus is talking to Sam, who's a Pharisee, and he says, do you realize that because of the way you have treated these people, okay, let's just not make it Old Testament anymore. Now let's make it more personal. Now let's make it Jesus coming to you, and again, Sam, I'm not picking on you because I don't think you do this. I'm pretty confident you don't, so I'm not chastising Sam. But let's imagine Jesus going to, to Sam or to you. I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. Well, maybe I kind of want us all to feel a little uncomfortable. But let's imagine Jesus and he says, hey, Sam, those people at school that nobody else talks to and everybody makes fun of and everybody whispers about and everybody mutters about, oh, look, there goes so-and-so. Don't sit with so-and-so. Did you hear what they did? Hey, suppose that they were one of your sheep and they wandered off. Because of the way you and other people treat them, they left. And they're not coming to church anymore. They're, they're not going to the, on the retreats anymore. They're, they're not coming to your, you know, your, your th- events after school anymore. They're not sitting with you at the lunch table anymore. You know why? Because you've treated them brutally. And now they're scattered. And now they're food for all the wild animals. I don't mean wild animals. But they're, they're now going to be snatched up by any group that will welcome them. Any group that says you matter to us. Regardless of, of, of sin or struggle or lifestyle or the way they look or the way they dress. Anybody that says, you know what? You don't matter to that guy, but... You can matter to us, Jesus says, they will find a shepherd. My sheep wandered all over the mountains, verse 6, and on every hill they were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. If Jesus were to walk into this room, to the filling station, and say to us, and I don't mean you as students, but us, I'm sitting where you are now. And he would walk in and say, hey, do you realize that there are people in your school that they are completely scattered and nobody's looking for them? Do you know what it's like to play hide and seek and then nobody comes looking for you? 
Some of you are like, yeah, I've done that. I've experienced that. You're like, hey, let's all go play hide and seek. And then you forget that somebody's hiding and you don't go look for them. Or maybe you play a joke on them and you don't go looking for them. And here's somebody waiting and nobody comes to look for them. Surely people in this room know what that feels like. Most of us have felt that kind of rejection from our friends. Even the most popular among you have felt that way before. Jesus says, imagine what that's like for nobody to come looking for you. I myself will search for my sheep, and I'm going to look after them, Jesus says. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I want to take you out of Ezekiel 34. I want to take you out of Jesus talking to Pharisees, and I want to put you in to your school. Insert name of your school. There are sheep that are wandering away, and they're getting lost, Simply because nobody's looking for them, and they just turn around one day and they realize, well, I'm way, I'm way over here. Sheep just kind of wander away. So Jesus says, I, I will tend my sheep. Verse 16, I will search for the lost, and I'll bring back the strays. I'm going to bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. So why do we have a girl's retreat and a guy's retreat? So that somebody who feels like they've never belonged can go and we're going to bind up the injured and we're going to strengthen the weak. Why do we go to impact? Why do we do the toy drive? Because there are sheep in our community that nobody else looks after and they are injured and they are, um, they, they are, are, are wandering away and we, can, we say we're going to look for them. That's why we go on mission trips. That's why we do service projects around town. That's why when we were able to go to Stones River Manor, we went there because those sheep matter. That's why we do most of the things that we do. And Jesus says, I'm going to look after my sheep. But he turns to, turns to the Pharisees and he says, hey, suppose one of you is a shepherd. Oh, you are shepherds, but you're not doing your job because look where the sheep are. But he says, I'm going to shepherd. But sheep just get lost because they just kind of wander away. I mean, sheep are not the smartest animals. And they just kind of find themselves eating over here. And, oh, I'll go over here and I'll go over here. So Jesus tells three stories. Why does he tell three stories? We talked about this last week. Somebody raise your hand so I can hear you. Why does he tell three stories? Yes, Elizabeth. Okay, that's one right answer. So that different people in the audience, and she's like, yes, I was right. I'll take Bible things for 200. All right, so you have, um, you have three stories because, one, Jesus wants to appeal to the people that understand shepherding. And then he's going to tell another story that's going to appeal to a different gender here in just a minute. And then he's going to appeal to adults and parents in a minute. That's one reason. There is another reason that he shares three stories. And we, I think we mentioned this already. Why does he tell three stories? A lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Ethan, why does he tell three stories? They're all about something being lost. That is right. Cooper, you on to it? What? There are three different ways that somebody can get lost. Now, I just need a volunteer over here that will be willing to stand up for a second to be a, a human volunteer. Right, Mandy, if you'll stand up for a second. So Jesus comes over, and imagine Mandy's in the crowd. And it's very likely, by the way, that Jesus would have picked Mandy for this next volunteer because he's telling another story. Jesus goes on and he says, or, or suppose, and who knows, I don't know how, I've told you, if I could get into a time machine and see anything in the Bible, I would get in the time machine and I would go and see Jesus tell a story. Why? Because I like to tell stories and I'd want to know, how did he tell a story that sinners and tax collectors wanted to hear? Because most lost people don't want to hear our stories. What was it about Jesus that made those people want to show up and have dinner with him? And he might have gone to a young girl and he would have said, hey, and he would say, what's your name? She says, Mandy. And Jesus says, hey, see Mandy right here? Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins. Now, in the story, it's likely he's not talking about an older woman, but probably somebody younger. More on that in just a second. I just want you to just kind of get in your mind that I'm talking about a person and not just a group of people. So, Mandy, have a seat. I'll, I'll probably reference you again. But he goes and he gets a young girl. And Mandy probably could have had a necklace of coins that she would have been wearing or maybe a headdress of coins. You see that a lot in the Middle East. Now, culturally, this is very awkward and very difficult to explain. But in the Middle East, even today, it's very common for a woman to have a, a dowry, D-O-W-R-Y, a word that some of you understand from your classes at school. And a dowry is uh, like a, a girl would have 
either property or money or some other land. And the dad would say, if you marry my daughter, you get, um, you get this and this and all these other things. Like, I'll give you all, this, these, all these cattle, and you'll get these lands. All of this I'll offer you if you take uh, my daughter. At this point, I'm realizing that, man, if your family's here, they're like, stop telling this story. But you, it would be a dowry. And for a lot of times, they would symbolize that by having a necklace which would have, you know, money on it. So it'd be like, a, again, it's very difficult for us to understand, but she's got 10 coins, this young girl, probably a young girl, and she's only got 10 coins, and each of these coins probably is the, the necklace that would have looked something like this, and those coins would have uh, had inscriptions on them, and they would have looked something like this, and she would have these coins, and she loses one. Because she's wearing this necklace to say, this is my worth. This is my value. Each of those coins was probably worth about a, a day's wage. So she's got a little over a week's money, um, worth of money there that she has on this necklace. This isn't the most wealthy of, of people. But Jesus may have gone and gotten a young girl and said, hey, suppose, suppose a young girl has, has got 10 coins, and it's probably wedding coins. It could have been another, another story, but most people would say he's probably talking about somebody that's got this sign. Otherwise, why would you look for it so much? If you're poor, any money you lose is fine. But if you've got this, it's, it's like losing your wedding ring. Some of us, I know, uh, my dad, I think, texted in a story last week about losing his wedding ring washing a car. I lost my wedding ring one time, and the person who helped me find it is here in the room. We were in the dunk tank at VBS, and I left the, the VBS uh, carnival, and I went to the McLean's to do a Devo. I'm standing at the pool, doing the devotional at the pool, and I reached down and just go like that, like most people do with their wedding ring, and I realized it wasn't there, and I immediately started to panic, and I thought, where did I leave it? Where did I change clothes? Where did it go? And in the middle of the Devo, I said, I got to go. Everybody was really excited. The Devo was over. And I jumped in my car and I ran back to the, my office and I looked around. I couldn't find it. I looked in the bathroom where I changed clothes. Couldn't find it. I went out in the parking lot. Couldn't find it. Went to the, around the dunk tank. Couldn't find it. And I looked all around everywhere. I couldn't find it. And then Randy Hobbs came to me and he said, hey, I think I know where your ring is. And I said, where? He said, I, I think it's probably in the dunk tank. I said, I've already looked there. He said, you better go look again. I said, why? And he showed me a picture that he had taken of the kid hitting the dunk tank. I'm falling in the water. And my ring is off of my hand, and it is floating above my hand as I'm going down like this. It looks like something from Lord of the Rings. There goes my ring. The light just hit it to where it was reflecting off of it. And I'm reacting, you know, as I'm about to go into the water. And I fell in. So we went back into that water, which by this time was a lovely shade of don't see me green or stay away green. And we're looking at the water. And sure enough, it was in the bottom of the tank, and there was my ring. And I didn't call all of my friends together to have a party but I celebrated. I was so glad that I found it. Now, I could probably, you know, have replaced it physically, but I did not want to lose this. It represents something so much more than the, the gold that it's made out of. And this girl, when she would have lost this, she would have thought, I am now worth less. Not worthless, but you understand I'm worth less. I had 10 coins to offer to some guy and say, look, this is my value, but now I'm, I'm worth less. And Jesus, now remember, he's not, for, for our sake now, let's pretend like he's not preaching in Bible times. He's now coming into your high school. And he just says, are there any girls here who just feel worth less? I know the answer to that question. Because if you've done ministry for one week, let alone 25 years, you know that there are all kinds of students who feel worth less because of a whole lot of things that have been lost. A coin doesn't wander off. A coin gets lost because somebody misplaces it or somebody drops it or somebody puts it somewhere where it shouldn't go or they throw it somewhere where it shouldn't go. And so I was looking for a coin to use tonight just to kind of hold up as an object lesson, just to say, you know, here's a coin. And if I lost this coin in my office, you can imagine how difficult it would be to find this coin in my office. But imagine a dirt floor, a house with a dirt floor with very few windows, with no light, and you're trying to find this coin. You're sweeping everything up. I mean, finding a coin in your house might be easy or in your car might be easy, but in a house with a dirt floor, it's very difficult. And if this was a very special coin, not like I lost a quarter, help me find a quarter. But you're trying to find one of these coins. Uh, side story, I hadn't intended on telling this, but the, the Rubios and the Skidmores went to Disney a couple years ago on Thanksgiving, and all of our funniest memories happened outside of the park, on the bus, in the parking lot, true story, never in the Disney parks. All the best stories happen. 
We're going, we're all excited. We're like, let's go to the Disney park. We leave our hotel, our condo. We're not staying on property to save money. And we drive up because we were like trying to save money. So much so that we got to the first gate. It was a toll booth on the interstate and it was a toll road. And David goes, we need quarters. Nobody had quarters. I had two quarters actually. And somebody else had one. And we needed to get like, I think it was $2 that we needed. And so we were going to need eight quarters. And we had like three. Well, then somebody finds a fourth. And then somebody finds a fifth. And then we find a sixth. And we're all very excited. And he's like, we only need two more quarters. Cars are pulling up behind us. And David's like, we're looking for quarters. And they're just like, okay, whatever. They drive away. And he's like, let's find a quarter. We're going through. And then I say, you know what? I bet somebody tried to throw a quarter into the thing and missed. And so let's just go look up there. So we walk up there. We're looking around. And we finally found a seventh quarter. And now we're just looking for one more quarter. And our day of adventure can begin. And when we found that last quarter, Lolly, you remember we found that last quarter? And we held it up and we danced around. It was so exciting. We were like, look what I found! I've never been so excited to see a quarter in my whole life. We ran around and we talked about, David and I later talked about this story. He said, it's like that woman that lost the coins. I was trying to find a coin tonight to use. I brought this one. But I went to the mailbox over here to get something out. And I found this with my name on it. And I thought, what is this? And it was a, a gift from, from Randy. For my 50th birthday, he said, I had it for your birthday, and I, I, I misplaced it, which is appropriate for tonight. And he said, and I found it, and I, um, I brought it, and this is, this is just such a cool gift. It is from the United States Mint, and it is a proof set of coins from 1971, the year that I was born. And it's a complete set of coins, unopened, from the uh, United States Mint, and it's just an extremely thoughtful gift. And I thought, this, I, I said, Randy, this would be a, a, um, awesome for tonight. So she finds this one coin because she says, I, I can't go out and show everybody my necklace because now I'm only worth nine and I had ten. So imagine Mandy looking all through her house. Her friends are like, hey, Mandy, we got no, 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 I can't do it now. i got to find this. Why not? She says, because I am worth less. They're like, Mandy, what's the big deal? No, I've got to find, you don't understand, I've got to find this. Because I don't have what all the other girls have to, to try to show all these other guys. I've got all these cattle or all these, uh, this land or all these animals. I, this is all I've got. This is my identity. It's this necklace. And Jesus says, one day it's going to be the thing that, that draws a, a, a man to her. And she says, I've got to find it. And when she finds it, it says she rejoices. And she says, I have found my lost coin. And then Jesus says, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That phrase, in the same way, I've already told you, what, what is that? That's Jesus' better way of saying what? That we hear all the time. Yes. This is kind of like that. But this story is a little different. It's a little different. You go, yeah, a sheep and a coin. They're different. We get it. No. Nope. How many sheep? How many are lost? What percentage is that? One percent. How many coins? How many are lost? What percent? We now have 10 percent. Jesus is making it. He's, he's narrowing in. He's now talking not just to shepherds, but he's talking to the girls. All the girls are like, oh, I know this story. All the shepherds are like, yeah, I got that story. He's now pulling everybody in the room in. But it's not just what Elizabeth said so that everybody can relate. It's very much like what I have to try to do on a Wednesday night of telling a story that a seventh grader may get into and maybe a twelfth grader can understand. It's not always done, and I never always do it well. But Jesus is trying to make sure that everybody feels a connection. But he's also, the math is getting different. I'm going to illustrate this in a really cheesy way probably not the right place to do this but because of time this is where it's going to fall many of you know that I'm a big Star Wars fan and I collected Star Wars figures when I was a kid I still have quite a few of them uh, on display I'm not really all that ashamed of it but in 1977 these things were a big deal some of your parents probably have these um, there was this particular play set that came out in 1978 it was the awesome cantina adventure set it was basically a piece of cardboard that looked like the cantina they convinced us it was a play set. That kid is having way too much fun playing with this, by the way. I never was that excited playing with this thing. But what I was excited was it came with some figures. That's the only thing that made this set worth anything is it came with some figures from the cantina scene. How many of you remember the cantina scene in Star Wars? All right, so um, I wanted to get it because this particular character right here, I know he's very ugly. Um, most people know him as Snaggletooth. 
He's got a name, but Snaggletooth is what we all knew him as. And Kenner, when they were making the Star Wars figures, they were only given this picture of all the characters, black and white pictures. They said, here are some of the, you know, make figures from these things. They weren't told their name. They weren't told anything about them. They just had black and white pictures. Well, you can tell this is just like from the neck up. It's not a full body picture. So they ended up making a guy that looked like this. That's their guy. He's known as the Blue Snaggletooth. And then when the movie came out, they realized, oh, well, that's not what he looks like. He doesn't look like that. Because the first time we really see him is in the Star Wars Holiday Special. Some of you probably have heard stories about how many of you have ever seen a clip of the Star Wars Holiday Special from 1978? I saw it live when it aired. George Lucas said he wished he could get rid of every single episode, every single cassette of it. I have a bootleg copy of it that I got from a comic book uh, store in the mall. I'm disclosing too much. I'll stop. So this particular uh, series came out in 1978. It was in Christmas around that time. And it was very, very exciting. And he actually makes an appearance. You'll see him there in the background. There he is. There's, there's Snaggletooth. You will also see, as I promised uh, Brent Roster, hey, I'm going to make a Star Wars and a Golden Girls reference tonight. Because in this Star Wars special, there's B. Arthur, who's in the Golden Girls. And she sings a solo in the song. It is really, really a bad holiday special, y'all. But that's how bad it got. But there he is. There's the figure. And that Snaggletooth. And they realize, oh, that's, he doesn't look like the blue guy. He's short. And he's not the same color that we thought. He's darker. So we're going to make, uh, which ironically, that figure looks also nothing like the figure in the movie, but that's beside the point. There is the, the figure they made. And the picture that's on the box actually comes from the Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood, the holiday special, and not even from the movie. Nobody really cares about this. There is a point. So here are the figures that came with that particular set, except not that one. You, you got the blue one. So a few years back, I dug out a lot of my figures. I found them in a, a bag and a box in our, my mom's attic, and I dig those out. I'm going through them and looking through them, and as a nerd does. And I was pretty excited about it, but I realized I'm, I'm missing uh, Blue Snaggletooth. And I thought, I, I, don't, I know I had one, and I've got every figure here that I ever owned, and where is it? I couldn't find it. And I kept looking all throughout my stuff, didn't find it. Looked in our attic, couldn't find it. I went everywhere. I thought, I've got every figure. My brother said, I think I've got some of your figures in my attic. So I went to his house, looked through, found three or four more, but never found that one. I was like, where is it? I got it somewhere. Went home for Thanksgiving, and I went upstairs, and I looked all over for it. And finally, in digging through boxes, found one box, found one bag, opened it up, and there it was. It fell out. And this figure is worth, you know, it's worth a lot of money. It's very rare. And I was just really, really, really excited to have this blue snaggletooth back. Now, nobody's going to share in my excitement. Maybe one or two of you are like, hey, good job. Good, good for you. But I know a little bit about what it's like to go looking for something that was very special to me and then to find it. And I did call a few of my friends and I said, hey, you'll never guess what I found. And I sent them a picture of it and they were like, oh, that's really awesome. I'm sure that thing's worth <clears throat> a whole lot of money. But I'm going to close tonight with a story that is more meaningful and bigger. A story that I, I think I've shared with you before, but illustrates this woman that is looking all over her house for something. I've told you, I think maybe at the end of one of our True Norths last year, the story about my mom's Bible. And I'm just going to repeat parts of it again. This is my mom's Bible that she got at Vacation Bible School when she was a child for bringing the most visitors. She still has this same King James Bible. It's got really cool pictures of Bible stories, and I used to sit at church and pretend like I was paying attention, but I was really just looking through these pictures to see David and Goliath or to see Noah's Ark or to look at Queen Esther or Joseph's coat of many colors. It was really exciting to look through some of these pictures. And one day my mom called me, and she was, was emotional on the phone, and I thought something really bad had happened possibly to a family member or to her, and she said, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. And I was like, you know, what's gone? I didn't know what she was talking about. She carried her Bible in this little satchel, this little bag, and it was zipped up. It was in her car. She always locks her car, but one day she went out, was thinking she was taking her car, decided to go in another vehicle, so she left and didn't lock her car, came back home, didn't realize her car was unlocked and went inside and came out the next morning, couldn't find her Bible. Somebody had come into the street that night and taken some stuff out of the car, and the cops said they probably saw that and thought it was a laptop or an iPad or maybe a gun case. That looks like a really awesome gun case, if you ask me. And they thought it might be a gun case, and then they took it, and, and they left. And my mom said, I searched the garbage can for it. I looked in the ditch for it because she thought once they realized it was a Bible, I'm sure they got rid of it. They probably did not think, you know what, I'll sit and read this. Maybe it has something in here to tell me not to do stuff like this. And it was gone for a long time. I forgot to call her and, and ask her how long that it was gone. Several weeks. And then it was about two or three weeks, as I recall, later, maybe, maybe a couple of weeks, she um, 
so mom, I'm sure you're watching. So text me and let me know how long it was. I'm just curious now. She said that she called me again, also this time emotional on the phone. She sent me a picture and she said, you're never going to believe my next door neighbor across the street showed up. And she said, is this yours? And it had uh, Andy Bivens on it. That's my mom's maiden name is Bivens. And she said, I didn't know that it was you. I didn't recognize the name, but I thought it might be yours. And she brought it over and she said, we've been out of the country on vacation or on a trip. And our housekeeper found it sitting on top of our garbage can in our carport. And so um, I didn't know what it was. I took it and I set it inside. It's been sitting inside on the counter of our house for a long time. The housekeeper put it there. I didn't know whose it was. I just looked and saw the name and I thought, well, you know, her name is Andy, but it says Andrea Bivens, but she goes by Andy. Maybe she'll know. And my mom said, that's my Bible. And she sent me a picture and she said, it's found. They found it. And I was like, what'd they find? She said, my Bible. And she's crying on the phone and was so excited. Well, first of all, I was humiliated because I thought, I don't know that I've ever been that heartbroken that my Bible has gone missing. Or would I have been that? I mean, I could have found another Bible, or maybe I wouldn't have even noticed it was missing. There's some weeks in my life where I might not, oh yeah, my Bible, where's it at? But my mom, who is in the Word uh, every day, so missed that Bible with so many notes. I mean, we're talking years and years of notes. And things that she's put in the Bible. It wasn't just the, the words of Scripture, but all the things that, that reminded her of other people. And all the things she had highlighted. And all the things that she had color-coded. And, and she said all that was gone. All of those experiences are gone. And then just like that, they were brought back to her. And somebody said, here it is. And she said, I know exactly what it's like. She went and she looked for it. The stories have that in common. Something goes missing and somebody turns over everything to look for it. But then Jesus is not done. The Pharisees are still there. He's already said, hey, suppose some of you have a sheep. Hey, suppose some of you know a, a girl who loses one of these coins. And when she finds it, she says, now I, my worth is back. And then we'll just set up next week with this. Then Jesus continued. He said there was a man and he had two sons. Now, I don't know if Jesus got two sons and brought them up there. But if you guys in the front row, who's going to be here next week? Who will be here next week? Okay. Knox will be here next week. Luke will be here next week. All right. You guys come up here for just a second. We're just going to close with an image of Jesus. I don't know that he ever picked volunteers. I'd love to know. I'd really love to know. I want to go. When I go to heaven, first of all, my questions won't matter anymore. I'll wad them up and throw them away. I won't care. But I want to say, Jesus, when you taught, did you ever just say, I need a couple of volunteers? And he may say, yeah, yeah, you remember Luke 15? Yeah, I went and I picked up a couple. There was a couple of guys sitting up there watching. And I said, hey, guys, come here. And he said, there was a dad and he had two sons. And everybody is on the edge of their seat because they know something is about to happen. You know the story. Most of you already know what happens. But I don't know if you really know everything about this story that you need to know. Sorry. Because it's not the story of the prodigal son, but it's the story of the prodigal son's there's two, two guys in this story that are lost. There's two of them that have their relationship with their dad severed. There's two of them that feel like their worth to the father is not what it should be or what it needs to be. It's not one, it's both. And so next week we'll pick up as the crowd is on the edge of their seats wanting to know what's going to happen to these guys. We'll pick that up uh, next week. You guys be here and be ready to volunteer for us again. Thank you. So next week when you show up, bring your Bible back, bring your notebook back, because we're going to spend the rest of this series in this story, which Charles Dickens said is the high point of literature and is the best short story ever written or told. When Charles Dickens gives you that kind of shout out, you're onto something. And it's just such an amazing story. And you go, yeah, yeah, I've been to VBS, I've been to Faith Boulevard, I've been to church camp, I've heard that story. I want you just to hear it again with some fresh ears as a 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grader in 2021. Thank you for honoring your principles. Be sure and thank them tonight. And thank you for honoring the Word of God. Our goal every week is that True North can allow you to just, in your heart, bow before the, uh, the throne and see the crown appear above the sun who wears it. Because walking around throughout the week, we, we miss it. And so hopefully tonight you've taken a moment to see it. Let's thank him. God, thank you for being with us tonight. And thank you for being the author of this book that when it goes missing, uh, may our heart break. 
the way that my mom's did when her Bible was missing because she so wanted not, not just the words of God, but she wanted that, that book that had been with her through so many stages of her spiritual journey. And God, as we look into the story of these two sons, God, I pray that you will open all of our ears and our hearts. And it's through the name of Jesus that we pray. And we all say together, amen. Love you guys and girls. You all have a great night. Take care.